Well, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Francis Buderman uh, from Penn State University. You've been learning a lot of statistics in the last few days, some gaming, uh, some genetics, uh, some ecology genetics. Uh, she specializes in statistics for wildlife. So I welcome you, Dr. Uh, Buderman. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. So I thought first I would just give a little introduction to my background. So I'm an assistant professor at Penn State University, and I'm what people would consider a quantitative ecologist. So I specialize in advanced statistical methods for learning about ecology, specifically wild populations. Um, important to note, my education is entirely in natural resources and wildlife and fisheries. So I do not have a degree in statistics. However, all of my research and the courses I've taken lean heavily that way. And that's fairly common for people who end up on sort of the statistical side of ecology, but not a pure statistician. Um, so I have a bachelor's in natural resources, a master's in wildlife and fishery science, and a PhD in fish, wildlife, and conservation biology. And here at Penn State, I teach a number of classes, um, including mammalogy, uh, an undergraduate class for wildlife and fisheries data analysis that sort of expands on some of the topics I'm going to talk to you about today, and then a grad graduate class for statistical thinking for ecologists. So I teach ecologists how to think about their data and their question and translate it into statistical models. And I just want to say up front, um, in case there are some of you out there who feel this way, um, I was never good at math in school. Um, I always performed very poorly, and it wasn't until I got to college where I had a professor in my natural resources program who was really able to translate mathematics and statistics into sort of applied questions and made me understand why it was important and how useful it could be. And so if you're out there and you feel like you're not sort of excelling at the math and statistics side of things, um, don't let that get you bogged down. Um, I never would have thought that I would have ended up considering myself sort of a statistician, but here we are. And so when uh, I got into this field because I really wanted to sort of conserve and help manage wild populations. And there are a few things we need to know um, if we're going to conserve and manage populations well. One of the basic questions is, how many are there? So how many are even out there? And so you'll see reports like there are 300 Bengal tigers left in the wild or 50 um, black rhinoceros. So how do we even know that there are that many out there? And often that's tied to a question of how many do there need to be or how many can we harvest? And so there are some populations of animals considered game species, which we do harvest. Um, and so those questions are how can we sustainably harvest wild populations? So I heard you were working on sort of uh, statistical genetics. And so a lot of that is based around some minimum population number that there need to be to prevent the population from spiraling into sort of inbreeding and genetic decline. Um, we're often interested in things like what is the survival rate? So how many individuals survive year to year and what things increase or decrease survival? So if we want to manage a population and things are looking bad for them, we need to know why. And then we often do things like we make changes to habitat how do we know management is working? So if we just go out, um, this is a, a Colombian uh, basin pygmy rabbit. And as of 2001, there were only 50 of these individuals in the wild. And the reason why they were in decline was due to a modification of the sagebrush habitat, which they need to survive. So if we're gonna go in and say like, okay, we increase the amount of sagebrush, um, we need to know if we're actually having an impact on the population. And so we need to know a, how many were there and what was their survival rate. And after we make management changes, how many are there and what is their survival rate? Because otherwise we're just sort of managing blindly and spending all of this money without really knowing that we're affecting change. Now this is an endangered species. I mentioned there are some species that we harvest and there are some species where this entire question gets flipped around. So for example, the feral hog is an invasive species that does a massive agricultural damage and damage to native habitat. So for this species, we might not be asking, how do we increase them? We might be asking, how do we effectively decrease the population? And so the question just gets flipped on its head. And in fact, 
Knowledge about abundance and survival is often required by the Endangered Species Act. So when a species is listed or delisted from the endangered species list, there's often numerical objectives that have to be met. So these are for the Indiana bat. And so to take the Indiana bat from endangered back to threatened, endangered is worse than threatened, we needed to do a few things. We had to protect 80% of their sort of best hibernacula, which is where they hibernate over winter. We needed a minimum overall population number equal to what we estimated in 2005. And we had to show that the population growth rate over a number of years was increasing. So we need to know all of those things to even remove that species from the endangered species list. And so you might think, okay, so we just go out and we count animals. So here's a fake scenario of going out and counting frogs in ponds. What's the average number of bullfrogs in a pond? Well, we just go out and we count them, right? And then if we wanted to know what their survival rate was, well, we would just do a second census, and a census is when you count all individuals in a population, and we would just compare and say, compared to last year, how many are there now? And so this is a scenario where the survival rate was about 50%. So we had half the number of frogs that we had the prior year. Um, there are some challenges of wildlife studies. Um, I'm sort of hinting at one of them as I just discussed it, but some things that are going to be different maybe than your traditional statistics. So you've, I think, talked about like t-tests and ANOVAs um, and COVAs. In wildlife studies, the thing you're interested in modeling or estimating isn't typically continuous, and it's almost always observational. So our studies are rarely experimental. Uh, so first, your response variables aren't typically continuous. Well, I just told you we, we count animals. So those are discrete. You can't have 5.5 frogs in a pond. Um, and, uh, or their probabilities. So the survival probability is 0.5. And so we have to figure out ways to model those quantities because a lot of the methods that you learn in sort of an introductory statistics course don't deal well with response variables that are binary or proportions. In addition, they're not experimental. So when you do a t-test, you're assuming that the only difference between two populations is the thing that you're experimenting, the treatment that you're applying. So if we go back to our frog example, maybe we were interested in how removing all the vegetation around the pond affected um, abundance or counts of frogs. So if we went in and removed all the vegetation and then we compared the average number of frogs in ponds without removed vegetation and with removed vegetation, our assumption there is that the only difference between those two groups is the removal of vegetation. In wild populations, this is really, really hard to do because there's so many other variables that can differ. So temperature or depth or elevation, or are there fish or salamanders that also use those ponds and you just can't control for them. Um, in addition, we have very strict animal care and use protocols. Um, so there's been a lot of sort of news recently that eagles are suffering from lead poisoning. If you remember, eagles also were the poster child for DDT. Um, it was affecting the thickness of their eggshells back in the 70s and really sharp declines in eagle populations. Well, now eagles are showing signs of lead poisoning. They're showing signs of lead poisoning because they can scavenge game species, which are often shot with uh, sort of lead um, bullets. And so they're basically imbibing lead from the animals that they scavenge. Uh, it'd be really hard to get approval to go out and deliberately expose eagles to lead to see how they respond. And so often we're looking at observational correlative studies. So we just sort of look at things like how much roadkill is in an area um, that has been left and is being scavenged by, by eagles. And does the time spent scavenging increase the mortality rate? And so we're not actually going out there and deliberately exposing subsets of eagles to lead. Um, be really tough to get that through the approval process. And there is one more problem. Uh, turns out animals are really hard to count. So a lot of us joke in this field 
that really we all have degrees in counting animals. It seems silly. It seems like you should just be able to go out and count them. But we have one really important issue that we have to face and that a lot of models in wildlife statistics have focused on dealing with. Almost all the models that we have developed are focused on dealing with one issue, and that issue is non-detection. So in this image, there is a snow leopard. And if I didn't know where it was, I would have a really difficult time finding it. And you can imagine if you were trying to go out and survey snow leopard populations, well, first of all, this is an incredibly rugged terrain. I certainly would not like to be hiking over that for miles a day. So frequently in surveys like this, they set up um, either game cameras or they fly over using helicopters and they do aerial counts. So there is that snow leopard in this image. So they blend in really well. Animals are cam camouflaged. And in addition, sometimes the animals you're counting just really don't want to be counted. This is a wolverine, and wolverines are notoriously aggressive, um, and they're very low density, and they're difficult to trap. They actually build these traps in the field out of these giant logs. So you can imagine trying to survey wolverines in the um, sort of mountainous regions of Montana and Idaho would be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So our big issue is that animals can't be census. You can't go out and count them with known certainty because they might be difficult to detect. They're highly mobile. So if I go out and do a survey out at the Arboretum, which is outside of my office, and I count all of the singing um, robins. This is obviously not a robin. This is a black Bernian warbler, but we don't have a lot of them here. So you go out and you count all the singing robins, and then you go out six hours later, those robins might be gone. It doesn't mean that they were never there. It just means that they left for a period of time. They can be really rare. So this is a cave splayfoot salamander. They actually went over 70 years before they detected the salamander again. So 70 years between the last time this salamander species was found in the wild and the most recent time. And sometimes they're migratory. So robins are here all the time. They move in and out of an area. But some species, they literally are only able to be counted for a very specific proportion of the year. So these are spawning salmon. Um, during non-spawning time, they're not countable. They're not in these easily accessible rivers. And so you have to be very careful about when you go out and survey these populations. So what can we do about this? Well, the first thing we can do about this is just acknowledge that we cannot get a census and whatever we're counting is correlated in a consistent way with the number of animals that are actually out there. So if I go out and count one animal, it means that there's actually five. If I count two, it means there is 10. If I count three, it means there is 15. So I think you might have talked about correlation. And so there's a consistent relationship between count and abundance. But we don't know what abundance is. So we don't actually have this. All we have is this. But we assume that if we detect changes in the counts, that that matches changes in abundance. So if one year our count goes way down, we're going to assume that abundance also goes way down. So this is this relationship that I'm talking about here. Your count is your abundance times some detection probability. What's the probability that you're actually going to encounter an individual and be able to count it? One of the assumptions of these indices is that detection is constant over time and space. So this relationship is going to be the same no matter what. So for example, some uh, fish species, uh, especially oceanic species, are just counted through catch. So how many, um, we have marine fisheries that go out and harvest marine fish, how many are caught? Now, if you looked at this relationship, um, the circles are our data points, and this line is basically just a line of best fit that we drew through all the points. So we would say the population must have increased from 1965 to 2000. We caught more fish. That means there are more fish out there. Even though we know we're obviously not catching all the fish, that would be very bad. That would lead to an ecosystem collapse. But what if what actually happened is we changed our net size? So prior to 1986, our nets had these big holes in them, and they let smaller fish get away. 
we increase or I guess we decrease our net spacing. Now we're catching all of those small fish. And now we're counting them. So actually the population might have just been stable or even declining, but we didn't know that this was impacting our ability to relate that count to abundance. And so if abundant or if your uh, detection probability isn't constant and you think it varies with things like um, individual or space or time, then we have to estimate it. And when I say estimate it, we're going to do it in essentially the same way you estimate a sample mean from a population. So you use the sample mean as an estimator of the population mean. So we acknowledge that this is not perfect. It is not the true value. There is some uncertainty, but we're going to use this detection probability to try and correct our counts to get at the estimate of abundance. The first thing we have to do is assume the population is closed. So when a population is closed, it means that there are no births, deaths, or movement into or out of the population. The reason we have to assume this in this case is because we're trying to estimate how many of them there are. So if you're going to sample the population twice, you need to assume that your abundance is not changing between time one and time two. You can do it, but you're going to violate assumptions of this process, and you have to know what those are. So to assume the population is closed, you have to sample the population very quickly in a short period of time when you know that no births or deaths or movement has occurred. This is gonna differ for different species. So some species which have really high mortality rates, you're gonna to wanna to sample that population very close together. If you have something like um, black bears, which are fairly long lived, you can spread that out a little bit because the likelihood of enough bears dying to influence your estimates here is fairly low. If you're working on something like a small mammal, they tend to have high mortality rates. And so to get this estimate of detection probability, all we're gonna do is calculate the ratio of how many we recaptured to the number captured the first time. And this makes sense. If I'm gonna sample the population twice, I'm gonna catch some number the first time, and then I'm gonna catch some number the second time. And some number of those individuals that I caught the second time, they would have been caught the first time, hopefully. If not, then your population size is very, very large and you'll see why in a second. So this makes sense because what we're asking is what's the probability of detecting an animal? Well, the probability of detecting an animal is essentially the probability you detected an individual twice. So we have just some notation here to help the equations make a little more sense. And this is called a Lincoln-Peterson model. So we actually, we love naming models in wildlife ecology. You'll see at the end, we have a model name for every variation you can possibly think of. So suppose our abundance is 30 individuals. Of course, we do not know this. We don't know what abundance is, but I'm telling you so that you can see how well we do um, during this capture program. So the first time we go out, let's say we capture and release 10 frogs. The second time we go out, we capture 11 frogs. Now, not all of those frogs were captured the first time, but some of them were. In this scenario, four of them were also captured the first time. So my recapture rate is four out of 10. So I was able to recapture four animals out of the 10 that I originally did. And then we can use this formula from before so I just moved um, <clears throat> detection probability over so that we could get abundance off on the left on its own. Now I just divide my count of individuals by my detection probability and I get an estimate, I get 27.5. So obviously it's not 30, but, and if you're doing this for a scientific study, you would also calculate the variance or the uncertainty in this estimate. And the uncertainty goes up the fewer individuals you capture and the fewer times that you actually sample the population. Now, how do we know that these animals were captured before? Here's where we get into why most of us got degrees in wildlife science, which is going out and getting to handle a bunch of wild animals. Okay, none of us decided that we were gonna study wildlife populations because we really like sitting in front of a computer and coding in statistical programs, but that's where we end up. So this is the fun part of our job. We get to go out and basically mark and recapture individuals in the wild. There's lots of different methods for doing this. So we have sort of these little 
sort of, um, they have like a barb on them that go into um, fish species. So then when someone catches this fish, they call in a number and report that they caught it. Um, some species require sort of unique ways to mark individuals. So this is uh, basically uh, paint on the back of this lizard. Uh, we use ear tags a lot in mammal studies. So these green ear tags are marking this individual. And she's in a um, basically a barrel trap that she was caught in. For birds, we often put leg bands on them. So these are just little clips that you essentially put on with fancy pair of pliers and they have a unique number on them. The important part of all of this is that there is a unique number that identifies the individual. Um, here's another one that we use often in mammals. It's just a little metal tag. And we're also using a lot of um, other methods to get at individual identity that don't require us handling animals. So if a species has unique patterns that can be identified via photographs, we can use those to match them up. And there are some cool computer programs that can help you do it. But this is really useful for species with spot patterns or stripes. It's used for whale flukes. Um, so you can basically match up just based on the physical appearance, but it doesn't work for all species. There's some other methods that we tend to use. Um, sometimes we're not just interested in recapturing the animal, but we wanna know where the animal goes between captures. And so for that, we have to use something called telemetry. And so uh, typically it's a collar that looks like this. Um, and I don't think, we also collared uh, cougars, but this is a lynx that we collared um, and has a little antenna and it links up with a satellite and you get GPS coordinates and these actually transmit to your computer and tell you exactly where the animal is. Uh, for marine species, we have to get a little creative. So marine animals are shaped a lot like torpedoes and it's really hard to get something that'll stay on their neck because they don't really have a neck. It just kind of like comes off. And so what people will do is just epoxy or glue a telemetry device to the back of the animal. This doesn't really hurt the animal. And in fact, what will happen is um, many marine mammals uh, like seals, obviously not dolphins or whales, but seals, sea lions, they will molt. And so this pelt of fur will come off in about a year. And so when they molt, that telemetry device just goes with it. Um, this is a study I worked on. So sometimes we're interested in harvest rates. And what we do is we tag an animal and then we don't see it again until a hunter calls it in. And so when we do that, we want the mark to be really unobtrusive. So the hunters don't know that they're harvesting a marked animal. And so we have these little button tags that go in and there's a number that you call when you harvest them and to say, I, you know, I harvested this individual. And we do the same thing with waterfowl. We just use these leg bands that have a number on them and hunters are supposed to call it in. That can be really stressful for an animal. So we've been working on non-invasive monitoring. So for these, we'll often put out uh, like a scent or a lure station, which will draw an animal in and you know, cats are cats. And so in this case, there's a little wire brush attached to this. And so the cats rub their face on it. They leave hair behind and then we can sequence that hair to identify unique individuals. Some animals have, again, unique coat patterns. So this is a wolverine and up here is um, hanging meat. So they just hang meat on a hook and they set a camera up right here facing the wolverine. And well, the wolverine stretches up to get the meat, they expose this unique blaze pattern on their chest, which is this white pattern here. And again, you can match those up across individuals. And we can also just get sign or presence and you still have issues with non-detection. So you still have to account for that. Um, and so you can use foot tracks. And um, I love this uh, track of an animal. If you ever see this, it's a river otter. So I think those are really fun. So I told you about the Lincoln-Peterson method. You just go out, you sample the population twice, you calculate the proportion of individuals you saw both times, that's your detection probability. You use that to correct your count, you get your estimate of abundance. All right, well, we rarely sample a population just twice. A lot of wildlife work is done over really long periods of monitoring. 
Um, so you go out every year or every week for a summer. So what if you have more than two visits? Lincoln Peterson doesn't really work anymore. And I told you one of the issues was that detection is maybe not constant. We only estimated one detection probability. Um, so there's a more general method we can use, and that's uh, where we build um, a model based on encounter histories. And encounter histories are just how many individuals you caught every time, sometimes, or no times. Now, how do I know how many individuals I caught no times? Well, I don't. That's the whole point of the exercise. Um, so this is just a two occasion version. So this is taking that Lincoln Peterson and putting it into an encounter history framework. If you have a one one, you were captured both times, one zero captured first time, zero one captured second time, zero zero not captured at all. And you could just keep adding ones and zeros to this. So you might now have, oh, you were captured the first and third time, or you were captured the first and second, but not the third, and so on. And then you can calculate the probability of each of these histories happening based on a detection probability. So for example, to have an individual get a one one, you just take the detection probability and you multiply it by itself. What's the probability you detect the, detect the individual the first time and then the second time? This would be um, um, the complement. So the probability you detect the animal and then one minus that is the probability you miss it. We know we miss animals. It's a whole point of accounting for detection probability. And so then you'd have the opposite scenario. And then over here, I just have the number of animals, they're hypothetical, in your study that had each of these detection histories. So by combining each of these multiplicative probabilities and how many animals had it, you can estimate the detection probability. Remember, we don't know what the p's are, but the number of animals that have each of these detection histories will help us estimate it. And we do this using a method called maximum likelihood. I'm not sure if you'll go into that, but it's used very frequently in studies where you don't have um, a continuous response variable. And then estimating those helps us get at this question. How many animals are out there that we didn't see? If detection probability was one, we could just add these up and we'd have our census, but we don't have that. So we need to get at this. And these detection histories and recapturing individuals over time is what helps us get at it. And with this version of the model, taking them and turning them into encounter histories, we can actually explain variation in the probability of being captured. So we can do things like maybe um, each observer is better at detecting animals than another. Okay, one's an expert, one's a novice. Um, we have behavioral variation. So some animals get what's called trap happy and some get trap shy. Uh, if you're trap happy, it means once you get captured, you repeatedly get captured more than you would expect otherwise. Um, so I know uh, I talked to somebody in um, Arizona and when they trap pack rats, they um, in the little trap, they put fig jam. And I was like, well, heck, you trapped me in that trap. I love fig jam. Um, so if all they do is go in and then kind of get manhandled and you put like a little ear clip in, they're like, well, that was worth it for a free dinner. Okay, so they get trap happy. And so they come back too frequently. Other animals get trap shy. Once you trap them, you're not going to see them again. They're out there, but they did not like the process. And so they're not going to go in a trap. And then we might also think that our ability to detect animals varies with things like sex or size or age or coloration. And so over on the left here, this is a juvenile redback salamander and these are adult redback salamanders. The way you typically sample salamanders is you go out at night when it's wet or raining and you scan the ground and look for salamanders. I can tell you from personal experience, it is much easier to see salamanders of this size than it is to see salamanders of this size. And you can actually build a model for detection based on these things that you think cause variation. So if you're gonna cover regression, this is very similar to a regression equation where we think that age has some effect on our ability to detect an animal. So, so far, the population has been closed, which means that no births or deaths or emigration or immigration are happening. 
So now if we want to go beyond abundance and estimate survival probability, we have to open the population. Okay, we can't estimate survival in a closed population because it's going to be one, because we don't let that happen via our sampling methods. When we try and calculate the survival probability, it turns out a bunch of other stuff has to have happened for us to re-encounter an animal, assuming that enough time has passed for them to die. So you go out, you catch an animal, you mark and release it. It could die. Okay. Or it could survive. If it survives, it could permanently leave your study area. And guess what? That's going to look an awful lot like dying because you're never going to re-encounter that animal again. If it does survive and stay in the population or return to the population during your survey period, it could be unavailable. So salamanders go underground. We're not digging up the ground to look for these salamanders. All we're doing is scanning the leaf litter. So this salamander is there. It didn't emigrate, but it's totally unavailable to us to sample. So assuming that it's available, then given that it's available, I have to, in the dark of night, while it's raining, see that salamander on the surface. So all of these things, if all you're doing is catching and releasing and then re-encountering an animal at some point later, you're not just estimating survival. There's all these other events that had to be true for you to just be estimating survival. So it had to stay in the population, it has to be available, and you to detect it. So all of these things happen between catching and then recapturing an animal. So this actually um, <clears throat> was... I guess the first application of this really was um, an ornithological application. So this is um, G. Dunnett. He was an ornithologist, and he was working on fulmers. And these fulmers nest on islands, so they come to an island to breed, and then they're gone. The only time you can capture them is when they're on that island. So, But they also knew we can basically count all the birds on the island. They could do a census. They didn't care, though, how many there were. They wanted to know what is the survival probability over time. And these are really long-lived birds. So this is done it with the same bird 30 years apart. So they were trying to estimate the survival probability. And then they tried to link it to biological processes that influence survival. So this is a what I focus a lot on is that the idea that data are what we see but we observe this process imperfectly. We don't actually get true survival rate, but we want to use models to connect our data to the process we're actually interested in. So the data are, did we encounter the bird, but the process we're interested in is survival. So when you have an open population, this recapture process gets more complicated. And so now we don't just have capture probability, but we have this apparent survival probability. So if I go out and I'm capturing fulmers, um, and let's say I'm doing it in a case where I can't census, me missing a bird in this case doesn't just mean I didn't detect it. Me not seeing a bird could mean it also died. So now we have two probabilities that can sort of generate the same outcome. If you think about those encounter histories of a one, zero, one, et cetera, if you have a zero in the middle, <clears throat> you know that the animal survived, you just missed it. So a one, zero, one, that helps you estimate the capture probability. The problem is when we get something like one, one, zero. The last time we surveyed that population, we didn't detect an individual. Did that individual die or did we just not capture it? And so these are just common notation that we use for capture and apparent survival. This is P and phi. There's actually a help forum for this uh, whole sampling design called Fee Dot. Uh, and so we use Fee very frequently. And so now to detect an animal, the second time you go out, it had to survive and you had to see it. The second time, again, it had to survive and then you had to detect it. And this goes on for as many times as you survey a population. So again, we have these capture histories. And like I said, this 
kind of capture history helps us estimate detection because we know it had to survive unless it's a zombie, um, which doesn't usually happen. Um, but in this scenario, we don't know what happened to this animal. So we can only say sort of what happened to this animal by trying to estimate things like detection probability. So if you have a case where detection probability is really, really high, if you get a zero at the end, that animal probably died because you're really good at detecting individuals. If your detection probability is really low, then you could either have had an animal die or you're just really bad at detecting animals. And there are some species that are just really hard to detect. And again, there's all these things that have to happen for you to get a certain capture history. And so when I said before that we have these uh, encounter probabilities that we can sort of maximize and estimate using maximum likelihood, this is this version, but for open populations. So it's more complicated than our P times P, right? So now if you have a capture history of one, 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 that means you saw the animal every time you went out. To get to that encounter history, there's only one way you can do it. You had to survive, be detected, survive, be detected. Only one way that happens, that route. But if you have something like a 110, well, there's two ways this can happen. You survive and then you're detected. So that gives you your first, your red one here. And then you could survive and then not get caught again. So that's a scenario where the animal survived the entire time, but you just missed it the third occasion. Alternatively, so we go down to route two, you survived and were detected, and then you died, okay? So that same encounter history can be created by two different pathways and so on. And so a one zero zero, there's actually three ways to get that because you could have just died right away. Um, so there's a number of ways you can get to each of these encounter histories. And we basically put these in sort of a distribution and we maximize the probability of each of these parameters given the data, and then we get our estimates out. But you'll notice that there are subscripts on all of these, like a one, a one, a two. And that's again, because there might be factors that influence detection and survival that are not constant over time. So again, if we were willing to accept that detection was constant, then we could just sort of correct for all of those in one go. So we could just have one P. But frequently you'll have things like, um, like I trap small mammals for one of my classes. And if it's cold out, we're not gonna get many small mammals in our traps because uh, they're not moving around very much. They're not gonna expend energy in a cold environment because that will lead to starvation. So they're not gonna be out and moving around to get caught in our traps. So if I have traps set out in week one and it's really cold, and then I have traps set out in week two and it's really warm, my detection probability is gonna be different between those two time periods. And I'm gonna to wanna to account for that. Um, conversely, things like temperature could also affect survival. So I just said cold temperatures can lead to starvation. So you might have really cold temperatures affecting the survival rates. So that first week, maybe you have more individuals die proportional to who is there versus the second week. So the whole goal is to connect these probabilities to actual biological processes. So um, we then put models on each of those parameters. And so this was a really cool um, study done on northern spotted owls and barred owls. I was not involved in it, but northern spotted owls are a population or a species in decline in the Pacific Northwest. And one thing that's really influencing their ability to persist is the presence of barred owls, which are aggressive and a competitor. And this was an actual experiment. These are very rare in wildlife, but they went and they actually removed barred owls from study units. And then they looked at the effect um, on uh, northern spotted owl presence after they removed the barred owls and they had treated and untreated sites. And so you can see up until 2009, this is just the trajectory of the population. Then they removed barred owls from some of the sites 
And in the ones that they remove barred owls, the population starts to increase a little bit. But in the untreated sites, it goes into decline again. This is um, extinction rates. And then here is detection probability. So barred owls also influence the detection probability of northern spotted owls because northern spotted owls are less likely to call when barred owls are in an area. So there's things that can influence both survival and detection, and our job is to try and separate them. Uh, you might have heard this phrase already. It's one that I live by. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. The entire point of modeling, um, in especially wildlife biology and other fields that are applied, is to match your question to your data collection and the appropriate modeling framework. I mentioned that we love naming models in wildlife biology. These are just some of the many models that you can use to estimate survival and um, detection probabilities. Um, basically every scenario you can think of, um, do you only recover dead animals? Do you recover dead and live animals? Do you know which animals survive and which don't? Do you um, subsample within an occasion? Um, are you doing nest survival? That's a different model. Okay, so it's crazy. We have so many models. Um, a lot of them are related in some way and they just sort of relax different assumptions. Um, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking specifically about my research because this was sort of a very general introduction to the biggest problem we have in wildlife biology, which is again, that we can't census the population. Um, and that if we try and take averages, we're really not matching our idea of how the population is working. So one of the questions that I've addressed is, um, how do you account for mortality that occurs before the hunting season in band recovery models? Band recovery models are just one of our many models. Band recovery models work by you capturing the animal once, putting a tag on it, letting it go, you never see it again. The only time you see it is when a hunter harvests that individual and calls in to report the band. And we actually had what are called reward tags. So um, if you don't give a reward, your reporting rate is really low. People don't like to call things in if they're not gonna get something. And so if you give them $100, your reporting rate is very close to one. So they've actually done studies to see how large the reward has to be to get people to call in. It actually varies by species. So waterfowl hunters require a different amount than deer hunters. Anyway, this number used to go to my office phone uh, when I was in graduate school. So I talked to approximately 200, 200 hunters every hunting season as they reported their deer. And the problem with... Um, these band recovery models is that they assume you ban animals and all those animals are available to be harvested. So let's say you go out in January when you capture these individuals. So deer and turkeys are really hard to capture outside of winter because food is abundant. So in winter, you bait traps and they come in. If you try and do that in summer, they're not coming in. So you go out, you ban a bunch of animals, so you ban 100. And then 25 are harvested in the hunting season, which is in the fall. You would say hunting rate is 25%. 25% of the population is harvested every year. But what if 50% of your population dies before the hunting even, even starts? Well, now your actual harvest rate is 50% because you only had 50 animals alive at the start of that hunting season. Then you recover 25. So you're going to underestimate the harvest rate if you don't account for that mortality. So I developed the model that let us do that. I do a lot of modeling where we try and look at animal locations and from those locations say something about their behavior at different times. So um, this is a radio collar that we put in an animal. It's like I mentioned it with the lynx and it tells us where the animal is even when we're not directly observing it. So it just uplinks to a satellite and transmits the locations to us. So there's this idea that you can use the things like step lengths and the turning angles, which are how tortuous the path is, to say things about how the animal is behaving at different points in time. So maybe this yellow is like a dispersing state and this blue is like a foraging state. So the blue are shorter step lengths than the yellow. And so we have our step lengths here, and this is a frequency plot, and then we have our turning angles, and we use models to split those into basically two distributions. 
And from these two distributions, we can then describe a behavior. So here, the blue are shorter step lengths and more uniform turning angles. They're just kind of going wherever. And then the yellow is large step lengths and really focused movement. They're moving in like a straight line. And then we can try and link that to some behavior. Um, I worked on uh, data from a Canada lynx reintroduction in Colorado. So Canada lynx were extirpated from Colorado um, probably in the early 1900s. There were uh, reports of them after, but that's when the population was probably no longer viable. And so they, in 1999, Colorado Parks and Wildlife went up to Canada and they started trapping lynx to bring down and reintroduce to Colorado. And so they reintroduced them in this black circled area here. And then they put little GPS collars on them. And there's two ways that we got locations. One was people getting in an airplane and using one of these devices to locate a Canada lynx. So they're basically just flying around trying to hook up to the radio signal that this um, collar is emitting. And then we also had the satellite component where we received locations no matter where they were because the satellite linked up with it. Um, and so the satellite uplinks are in blue and then the flights are in orange. Um, and this is where they were reintroduced, this black circled area. Over 12 years, this is where they went. So they did not stay in Colorado. One individual went to Nebraska and they went to get him and they brought him back and then he went to Iowa. So this is the same animal. So he just really wanted to be a Midwesterner. I actually have to cut this figure off. There's one animal that made it up towards Banff where he was legally harvested in Canada. So you can harvest Canada lynx in Canada. Um, they're a fur bearer. Um, so it just makes everything else hard to see, but it's up here somewhere. Uh, so they moved incredibly far. And unfortunately though, this data was collected at a time where we didn't have the technology we have now. And so we only obtained locations about once every week and we had really large measurement errors. So I said, oh, these links go and you can just know where they are. Uh, turns out that you knew where they are within a measure of hundreds of kilometers potentially. So you had to actually correct for that. Um, these collars were notorious for having really large measurement error. Um, one of my colleagues was working on harbor seals in Alaska. He had harbor seals in the middle of Russia, according to the telemetry device. So obviously they were not actually there. So he had to correct for that just like I did. Um, I also worked on um, how cougars perceive uh, the landscape in an urban wildland interface. All these little moving dots are cougar locations over a period of about two years. And this is sort of the wild urban interface outside of Boulder, Colorado. So Boulder is rapidly expanding, but they do a really good job of maintaining green space around the um, city. But this is getting on this side more and more urbanized. And so cougars are bumping up against sort of a harder boundary. So our question was, how does the landscape influence cougar movement? And then the last one I'll talk about is figuring out why certain species of waterfowl are in decline when others are doing really well. And so we had uh, these counts that have been collected by the Fish and Wildlife Service every year for 60 years. This is an incredible data set. Um, it's one of the longest running monitoring programs in the world. And so they do these counts of waterfowl. Again, they fly airplanes. I've never flown an airplane, but lots of wildlife biologists spend a lot of time in them. They count the ducks as they fly these transects. So you're in an airplane just counting the number of ducks you see along this transect. And we try to separate out what causes ducks to select certain habitat and then what habitat actually promotes survival and reproduction. And what we found is that this northern pintail, which is a species in decline, is selecting cropland. So they like areas with a lot of uh, crop acreage. But when they settle in areas of high crop acreage, their population goes down the next year. And so we don't have the exact mechanism for it, but the reason why this might be a particular problem for a pintail, unlike other species, except maybe the canvasback, is that they're showing really strong selection for it, so they really like it. 
and they are really negatively impacted. Most of these other species, like they kind of like it and then they do okay. Um, this one, like the redhead, they like cropland and then they don't do great when they are in it, but they don't have the declines that uh, Northern pintail do. And so um, this is kind of what I spend my time on as a wildlife biologist. Uh, it's actually a lot of statistics and computing, which people don't expect, um, but it is uh, really important to understand how to connect your data to processes. So people think, oh, you just go out and handle animals all the time and you have lots of fun. Like, yes, but all of that has to have a purpose and we have to actually connect it to the way that we do conservation and management. And so I'm happy to take any questions. See, I see some in the chat box that I missed because I didn't have it open. Let's see. Yes, so um, some birds like uh, Bella was mentioning hawks get really trap shy. Um, they actually do some where they set out a game camera so they know that a bird is in the area and then they use like a remote net to go over the bird um, so that there are no people actually in the area. Um, and then I was also asked kind of how did I end up here? Um, well, I liked biology. And uh, so I looked for programs that would let me do biology and I really liked ecology. So I applied for programs that had some kind of ecology component. One of my first choice schools, which was Cornell University required that you put a second choice or no, they required you put a first choice. So you could not go into Cornell as undecided. You had to say, I wanna be in this major. And then they let you put a second choice. And so uh, I guess this maybe showed my inclination early on because I was like, well, I'm going to increase my probability of getting in if I put a second choice. And so I put biology and then I put natural resources. And I ended up getting in, but as a natural resources major, not as a biology major. And so I considered switching. And then, like I said, I took this class um, in sort of estimating survival and abundance. Um, and I was like, this is what I want to do. And I really liked it because, well, I, at first I really liked it because I thought there's a clear answer. Like you get a number at the end of the day and that number tells you something about the population. Um, and now really what I say is that the important thing about wildlife statistics is understanding how uncertain you are. And so it isn't just one number, there's uncertainty that you have to capture. And so you don't just get a number of abundance, you get a range of abundance and your management is gonna, um, management decisions might change depending on how certain you are. Um, and so that's how I ended up in natural resources. Um, it is a competitive field. Um, it's getting, it's, it's a field that you typically have to move around a lot for. So you do your undergraduate and then a common trajectory is to, do temporary field jobs, which are typically labor intensive. Um, I will say don't volunteer. Um, I know people do that. It's not a good model because it disenfranchises people who can't volunteer their time and need a paycheck. Um, and we're getting better about doing that. But um, one nice thing is that um, when you go to graduate school, you get paid to go. So I have not paid for my graduate school um, and I've received a stipend the entire time. Um, so you get a livable wage because you're basically being paid to do research. Um, so um, I'm happy to talk about that more if you wanna reach out to me via email. Um, I love talking about kind of how to strategize to optimize your chances of, of doing what you want. Um, and so I think my, I can just put my email in the chat, but. Are there any other questions? I, for one, found this amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's um, it's a fun it's a fun job. Um, it's uh, useful. So I think that that's when I was studying sort of early in my career. Um, I really wanted to take to do something that had management applications. So not just science or modeling or statistics for the sake of doing it, but actually helping resource managers make good choices. So um, for all of the projects I've worked on, except for um, 
the pintail, although I'm working with a nonprofit for that. Um, I've been working with state and federal agencies. So Pennsylvania Game Commission, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, sort of they work with researchers to answer these questions. So they'll come and say like, we want to know, you know, where Canada lynx went when we didn't see them and why they went there. And so then that's kind of how I got paid through graduate school was to work on those kinds of projects. Um, and then they can use that when they're managing areas for Canada lynx. So for lynx, um, they had these areas that they had identified as really important for lynx. And then if you actually model their movement, like half of them weren't even in the movement paths. They were like way out where lynx didn't even go. And so in that case, it's like, well, then we, then we don't have to spend resources maintaining those areas for lynx habitat because the lynx aren't even going there. They're, it's not even in their sort of landscape map. There are specific colleges, Bella's asking again, um, for wildlife management, they're typically going to be state schools um, for wildlife. Other schools will be good in ecology, but um, because wildlife management and conservation is so applied, it typically falls under land grant universities that really focus on it because the land grants mission is to basically serve the people of the state. And so like at Penn State, an important part of our mission is that we help manage wildlife for the benefit of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so we work heavily with the state. And so in state universities, you're going to get some of that more than you might at something like a, like a Swarthmore or Princeton um, or smaller schools that focus more on sort of the general biology. Truly, thank you for your time and what an excellent presentation and exciting work. Thanks so thank much. You.